So hello everybody, thank you all for joining us for this webinar, which is part of our series of presentations being delivered on applying evidence in practice as part of the Comorbidity Project, which is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health. My name is Christina Morell. I am a Senior Research Fellow and Program Lead of Treatment and Translation in Complex Populations at the Matilda Centre um, in sorry, the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney, a great way to start along with Erin Madden, who's a project officer on the Comorbidity Project, and Professor Catherine Mills, who is director of our early intervention and treatment research, also at the Matilda Centre. I had the very great pleasure of facilitating this webinar, which is being presented by Sarah Maguire. Before we start, I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting and recognise, of course, that we are meeting across Australia today. The traditional owners of the lands that I'm currently on are the Gadigal peoples of the Eora Nation, but I'd also like to pay my respects to other traditional owners of the lands across Australia for everybody else who's here. I'd also like to recognise and acknowledge the many people with the experience of mental illness and substance use, as well as their families and carers, many of whom have generously contributed to the development of the comorbidity guidelines and our other resources. If you've been to one of our webinars before, you would have already heard these few introdu introductory slides about Zoom already. So please feel free to do something else just for a little bit and rejoin me in a minute. Um, just to go over a couple of things before we start, to first of all, let you know that whether you're joining us in the live stream or watching the recording, you're in listen only mode, which means that we can't see or hear you. So you don't need to worry about muting yourselves or turning off your cameras. Just make sure that you can see and hear me and us. And secondly, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A and chat buttons on your screen. Please feel free to click on the Q&A button, type in any questions you have for Sarah at any time during the presentation today. If you have any comments or anything other than questions for Sarah, please use the chat. And this just helps me and Erin identify any questions that you have for Sarah and separate those out from the general comments. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact Zoom support, or you can access the recording of the webinar, as well as the PDF handouts of the slides from today and they'll both be available to download from the website on your screen there. And we will also be sending a follow-up email to everybody who's here with a link to access those. If you find Zoom chat distracting, you can have a play around with the settings on your end to disable what messages you see. And to do this, you just need to go to your Zoom desktop app if you have it installed, click on the settings wheel in the top right-hand corner of your screen, select chat on your navigation menu, and you should be able to change what messages you see by changing your push notifications or having a play around with your do not disturb times. But it can take a little bit of fiddling around. So I've put the Zoom link there for more information on screen in case you wanna follow up a little bit later. And Erin will also post that link in the chat. So, Today's webinar is focused on eating disorders and, and AOD use. And just before Sarah gets started, I wanted to quickly mention our next webinar, which you can find out more about and register for at our website. The link to do that is on screen. And thank you again to everybody who's been coming along to this series, either live or watching recordings later and sending through feedback and suggestions for what you'd like to see in the future webinars. We do ask for your suggestions and feedback at the end of each webinar and today's topic, as well as the next one, have both been organized in response to your suggestions. So please let us know if you have any other thoughts um, for future areas you'd like to see as part of this series and we'll see what we can do. So now it's my very great pleasure to stop talking and introduce our presenter for today. Uh, Associate Professor Sarah Maguire is Director of the Inside Out Institute for Eating Disorders and is a clinical psychologist, researcher, educator and policymaker with 20 years experience in the fields of eating disorders. Sarah has worked in hospital and community settings, supervised clinical teams and trainees, and is a, clinical, uh, is a specialist clinical director, clinical trainer and board approved supervisor. So those of you who are familiar with the comorbidity guidelines might know that the management and treatment of eating disorders was one of the disorders that we added to the second edition in 2016. We've been able to work with Sarah on the eating disorder section as we finalize the third edition. So we were very excited that she was able to present a webinar as part of this series. Having said that, um, unfortunately, Sarah has had a last minute clash, which means that she wasn't able to be here today, but she has sent us a pre-recording um, of a webinar, which we will live stream for you now. If you send through any of your questions as you would normally do, we will collate these and send them through to Sarah and we will post your answers or post answers to your questions on our website. Um, so having said that, I will start the recording of her webinar. Hello, I'm Sarah Maguire from the Inside Out Institute for Eating Disorders here at the University of Sydney. Thank you for having me 
to speak today on treating eating disorder symptoms in the context of comorbidity. This is our beautiful um, centre here at the university. We're part of the Charles Perkins building. And this is our website, uh, which has a, houses a lot of resources and training programs that you may find useful, all related to eating disorders. As you can see, we've designed our website to um, sort of be tailored and curated depending on the user. So I'm here for myself for lived experience. Someone I may know may need help for carers and families. I'm a health professional or I'm a researcher. And here in this health professional uh, portal, there are a lot of, res of resources for health professionals who are working with people with eating disorders or with symptoms of eating disorders, disordered eating. And our website um, link there just below. So comorbidity in eating disorders is the norm not the exception. What are eating disorders? Eating disorders are mental illnesses marked by overvalued ideas. It's useful really when you're treating them, particularly in the, complex, in the context um, of multiple concerns, to just always remember that they're actually extreme fears, almost thinking of them as a phobic response. So that when we're talking about food, weight and shape, this is very triggering for the client. And when there is any trigger associated with those like eating, like being weighed, that the client may have a phobic, almost phobic response to those stimuli, certainly a, a very feared response. And that the obsessions and compulsions of the eating disorder centering around food, weight and shape evolve from that overwhelming fear. Eating disorders are often accompanied by comorbid conditions, including depression. They're often preceded by childhood anxiety disorders. In fact, very high rates of childhood anxiety disorders up to, you know, sort of 65 to 80 percent, depending on the research that you review prior to the onset of an eating disorder. And obviously there are lots of other psychiatric illnesses that are very common, including DNA, but access to is very common. OCD is one of the more common comorbid anxiety disorders. Anorexia nervosa was first described in 1873 and introduced to DSM-1 and then in DSM-3 became part of the eating disorder category. Bulimia nervosa was first described in the 80s and was included in DSM-4. Binge eating disorder was only included in DSM-5. And then of course, we've got what used to be called eating disorders not otherwise specified that is now referred to as OSFED or other specific feeding and eating disorders, which really houses all of those sub um, sub uh, threshold eating disorder diagnoses, sub threshold A and B and BED. But this category shouldn't be confused with, you know, mild illness. Um, research shows that in the EDNOS, EDNOS now OSFED category, you can still have very high mortality rates, very high medical morbidity. So these do need to be regarded as serious eating disorders requiring treatment as well. This is a, just a useful video that I won't play right now, but I included the link for people um, around what eating disorders are. It's available on YouTube. Um, it's, it's just sort of a nice overview of the eating disorder categories and their medical complications. So what about comorbidity? We know that lifetime psychiatric comorbidity in eating disorders is very high. Here are some of the rates, you know, between 56 and 98% and across um, the diagnostic categories, depending on the research that you're looking at. Obviously, uh, our research in particular epidemiology and eating disorders is imperfect. So we're always looking at a range, really. Um, the highest comorbid conditions in eating disorders are major depressive illness and the anxiety disorders. But of course, there are lots of other comorbid conditions, including substance use. What we do need to remember is that there are significant medical comorbidities in eating disorders. In fact, one might think of eating disorders as both um, mental and physical health conditions. What do we know when comorbidity is present? Well, with dual diagnoses, there is a poorer prognosis, there is higher misdiagnosis, there is increased social and psychosocial impairment, there's decreased quality of life, there are higher rates of mortality and a more chronic course of illness. So prognostically, not a good indicator at all. Um, perhaps on the upside, 
Um, there is some evidence to suggest that with a dual diagnosis, the person might be more likely to seek treatment than a single, single diagnosis. But then again, they are often excluded from treatment programs and from intervention trials as well as outcome trials because of that comorbidity. Ideally, as we all know, mental and other healthcare team should collaborate to support integrated treatment of physical and mental comorbidities. But as we all know, the health system is not structured to deal with these comorbidities in this integrated collaborative way. Instead, patients with comorbidities are often labelled as tricky, resource draining, treatment resistant or non-compliant. Still, and this is really the message of the day, eating disorder behaviours serve very similar functions as other coping behaviours like those observed in DNA, gambling, self-harm, and can be targeted in therapy in the same way. The interventions we bring to other coping behaviours can be helpful for eating disorder behaviours. So don't be afraid or reticent to include the targeting of eating disorder behaviours as part of your broader CBT or DBT or other treatment for other coping behaviours like those we see in drug and alcohol presentations. How do we know if an eating disorder is present? Very briefly, I've directed you to our brief six item um, digital screener that's available on our website. The link is here. And that will tell you if someone is at ultra high risk or has a likely eating disorder. As I said, six questions, the person does it themselves. It's scored online and spits out the answer. And then if you want more of a diagnostic indicator, the eating disorder examination questionnaire is also available on our website. It's digitised, it scores itself. It gives you a nice printout at the end. So what are the treatment principles when treating someone with an eating disorder? whether or not it's in the context of comorbidity, but these certainly apply to a comorbid presentation. Collaboration and empathy. Engagement is absolutely crucial in eating disorders. We know that these are illnesses that people can be attached to, a little bit more on that later. Externalising is one of the key skills when you're working with a person with an eating disorder, and certainly this can be used in drug and alcohol as well, where you see the person as separate to the illness, where you will talk about the eating disorder sounds loud today or feels loud today, or what does the eating disorder say about that, or what is the urge that the eating disorder may have had in this situation. Ambivalence is a core part of an eating disorder. It's a symptom. It should really be in the, in the diagnostic categories. Um, so it's very important that we roll with resistance when we're treating eating disorders. Stages of change are very important, more on that later as well. Meeting the patient where they are at, at the motivational stage that they are at for change. Again, these are skills that are shared across the DNA and eating disorder um, health professional community. Clear communication. Be aware of potential cognitive impairment, starvation, and even when the person may not be underweight, they can still be starving. Um, people with eating disorders restrict their eating for long periods, even if they binge and purge. And so they may well be in a starved state and a lot of deprivation might be at play. So just be aware of cognitive impairment and the need to, at times, communicate clearly, be expect, expect as we always really do in therapy, to repeat ourselves without judgment. Avoid comments wherever possible about physical appearance. You don't look like you have an eating disorder is a disaster comment. <laughs> um, if that's ever said to the person and you happen to be the therapist that comes after that, you will, you will need to deal with that. Um, you're looking so much healthier, try to stay away from it. Even simple comments like you look well or you look good are very triggering to a person with an eating disorder. It's best just to stay away from that altogether in the therapeutic encounter. Always remember when you're working with clients with eating disorders that they are engaging in a constant battle with the eating disorder. We need to work with the person collaboratively against the illness without pushing too far against that illness that we activate that protective sort of ambivalent egosyntonic attachment to the illness. A bit more about that later on too. Look, almost 
I always recommend that when you're working with eating disorders, you work in a multidisciplinary team. I certainly, even though I'm an eating disorder expert clinician, you might say, would never work without a medical practitioner involved. GPs are, are most commonly the medical practitioner I work with, although I'm very happy to have psychiatrist and paediatrician involved also. Um, but just the sheer availability of general practitioners and the fact that they refer clients to you and are, and are very well positioned to monitor medically and to escalate uh, medical concerns. Then obviously for most eating disorders, we need a mental health professional involved in the therapy, but dietitians are also very helpful. And when you're talking about refeeding or dramatically changing eating, um, you, can, you can often observe that you need that dietitian to get the right dose of care for the individual. So what are the primary targets of therapy for eating disorders? And I sort of list these because these are the targets that you can incorporate into your routine care of a person with um, a comorbid condition and start to weave these in and target them even as part of your existing therapy, even if you're unable to do um, some of the standalone eating disorder evidence-based packages that I'll sort of briefly describe in this presentation. So obviously being underweight or striving to be under, underweight is one of the primary targets of therapy and eating disorders. Binge eating, both deprivation driven binging, but also emotionally driven binging. And then there can be other drivers of binge eating as well. Purging behaviours, um, self-induced vomiting, laxative abuse, Excessive exercise is regarded often as a purging behaviour because it's about um, eliminating the calories from the body and it's certainly part of a lot of eating disorder presentations and can be targeted in our behavioural hierarchies. We work a lot with the over-evaluation over of weight and shape as part of self and my worth um, and am I good enough? We work with over-evaluation of control and the pursuit of control as part of self and a good self and a perfect self. Obviously, dietary restriction and restraint need to be targeted. We sort of make a bit of a distinction about those, that restriction is the physiological, I'm sorry, the, um, the physiological and psychological deprivation. And then we've got dietary rules as part of restraint. Then also we need to think about food as a numbing, avoiding or coping strategy. And this might often form part of your targets in therapy. Um, the other functions of eating disorders that you'll need to be aware of and potentially target is that they can be viewed as protection, as a way to avoid the maturing body, but also the maturing psyche. Sometimes they can reorganize a family to respond to the person with the eating disorder in the way that they feel they need to be responded to. Sometimes they very desperately do need to be responded to. They can be um, a false self, a part of identity, but a very valued part of identity, certainly not viewed by the person as false, but really viewed as the self. And over time, that therapy is about working to create other structures of self that don't involve illness or something for me. And that can be very common in binge eating in particular. It's something for me. We need to target poor quality of life or very limited quality of life domains related to identity. And then, of course, cognitive challenging of faulty beliefs around food, weight, shape and self. So to do a sort of whistle stop tour of a few of the evidence based treatments, the principles of which you could incorporate into your treatment of other conditions, um, or these are standalone packages as well. And there are various types of CBTs that have been demonstrated effective in the eating disorders. And it's worthwhile remembering that these, of course, were direct, adapted directly from the depression and anxiety CBT manuals so there's nothing inconsistent about CBT for eating disorders in terms of general CBT treatments. This is a um, one of the CBT formulations for an eating disorder that that um, underlying it is dysfunctional or unhealthy schema and self-evaluation around shape and weight and the need to control these, driving a sort of perfectionism or a drive, super drive for control and thinness. And this sort of core low self-esteem drives strict dieting and other weight control behaviours like exercise, as well as achieving or overachieving in other domains. 
This strict dieting can lead to binge eating. Biologically, the body is unable to um, uh, continue that strict dieting and um, the body biologically wants to consume food whenever it can and store food in the body for what it interprets as the periods of starvation or for other individuals, it leads to a starvation syndrome and very low weight in anorexia nervosa. And then in both of these conditions, we can see that compensatory behaviour for caloric intake of any kind in anorexia or for a binge eating episode in the binge eating disorders involving vomiting and laxative misuse. And of course, this all feeds back to this sort of dysfunctional over-evaluation of weight, shape and control. So what are the stages of CBT therapy? Well, there are four aims in, in most CBT treatments. First and foremost, engagement and the establishment of the rationale for the need for change, and then being very mindful of maintaining that engagement with the client over time. These are egosyntonic illnesses to which the um, individual can feel very attached. They are performing a very important function often for the individual. So you've got to maintain that engagement as you work to decrease the influence um, and the presence of the eating disorder. To increase understanding of the problem in stage two, a personalised formulation of the above. To establish real-time self-monitoring of food intake and eating disorder behaviours. A personalised psychoeducation about the function that the eating disorder is serving and about nutrition and psychological wellbeing in general. We need to psychoeducate about weight and weight change and really reduce concerns about weight over time and about the dramatic or perceived dramatic um, influence that small eating changes can have on weight. We need to introduce and establish regular eating and that's part of the starting well phase of CBT. Usually in a CBT um, treatment and, and indeed in, in all treatments um, for eating disorders, you will often use weighing. Um, it needs to be a collaborative, very skillful approach. And I just personally believe that it requires training. This is possibly the most triggering thing you will do with the client in the room. We don't often eat with our clients. That would be an equally triggering thing in community care. Certainly if you're working in a hospital setting, you will be supervising meals. And that and weighing the client are the most triggering things. So it really requires training and this webinar is not sufficient to do that. Um, it is an opportunity to educate the client about weight. It provides objective data about what's happening as the client refeeds and changes their eating and challenges their catastrophic thinking around that. You as the therapist need to help interpreting what the number means and managing that emotional reaction, um, delivering emotion regulation skills, distress tolerance, et cetera. It also challenges the checking and avoidance behaviours that go with weight and number, et cetera. And of course, the other really important thing about weighing is that we have a duty of care to our clients. And a lot of people with eating disorders um, are at critically low weight or are not at a low weight, but are losing weight at a very unhealthy um, trajectory. And so we have a duty of care to understand when their medical um, status may have changed and to make sure we're flagging that with the medical practitioner that is working with them. Always useful to remember that when you are working with weight data and eating disorders, one cannot interpret a single reading as that meaningful. We're looking at the weight over the month um, around about to see what the trajectory is for the individual. People with eating disorders will put a lot of focus on every weight point and you're actually working to counter that, but to monitor it appropriately over time. Regular eating is a foundational part of treatment for any eating disorder. So when you're working with people with eating disorders, even as part of a comorbid treatment package, that sort of um, nutritional rehabilitation, the resumption of more normal um, eating, both the architecture of eating across the day, so that we have something that looks like breakfast, something that looks like lunch, something that looks like dinner, something that looks like snacks, and we're building that architecture of regular eating over time, as well as the content of those meals over time. This is where a dietitian is super duper helpful. They have all of this expertise. 
And we're also working if needed for that weight restoration, if it's a more anorexia nervosa or underweight presentation. And then for the binge eating presentations, it is that regular eating that will stave off biologically driven binges over time. Um, it provides that structure and predictability. Apologies, my lights go out in here uh, periodically if I don't move enough. It provides that structure and predictability. And also it's that opportunity over time later in therapy to work on improved hunger and fullness cues with the client. Then of course, cognitive challenging and the challenging of dieting rules forms part of CBT for eating disorders. I won't go through all of these, but I wanted to give you some examples of the types of thoughts that you would be challenging in the early stages of, of CBT treatment. As you move later into CBT, you'll be challenging more general um, unhelpful thoughts that you would see in depression and drug and alcohol and other comorbid conditions. They are certainly a part of the profile in eating disorders. There are lots of other treatments that have been evidence-based for eating disorders. CBT for adults has, I guess, the most support. Um, today, I've very much focused on the adult treatments rather than child and adolescent um, because we're looking at that comorbid presentation with drug and alcohol. Not to say that that doesn't occur in younger people, but the focus for this one hour webinar was, was adults. And the other evidence-based treatments are motivational enhancement therapy, a thing called SSCM, the Maudsley Mantra model, interpersonal therapy has a reasonable amount of support, particularly in the binge eating disorders. Dialectical behaviour therapy has been adapted and is a good one when you're talking about the treatment of drug and alcohol and eating disorders comorbidly. You can certainly just add the eating disorder behaviours into that same DBT approach. And I'll talk about that a little bit further on. And then Focal psychodynamic therapy has actually been proven in one of the very large German trials of um, community-based treatment for eating disorders to be as effective as, um, as the very well-known CBT, I guess, um, evidence-based packages. I thought it was pretty important that we talk a little bit about MET today, motivational enhancement therapy, because obviously this is used in treatment of drug and alcohol ubiquitously. And it's a core skill set for working with eating disorders also. So um, very useful to think about how we would apply it to the eating disorder um, symptoms. So how does ambivalence present in eating disorders? Illness de denial, treatment refusal, presenting to care with other problems. This is actually very common in eating disorders, presenting to the GP with all sorts of other symptoms, even presenting to psychotherapy for other things. Um, and the eating disorder, the thing that we sort of value and are ambivalent about whether we want to target um, is not the presenting concern. Certainly we can have what um, people can refer to as sabotage of, of treatment. I don't like to think of it that way. Um, I think it's just um, the illness getting in the way potentially of, the, of, of, of what you're trying to deliver in therapy and your job as the therapist is to think about how you're going to deliver it in a way that the um, client can receive. But rationalising, defensiveness, certainly secrecy, um, lying can be can be present in eating disorders. Again, not that we that it is um, useful to refer to it as such. Um, really, it's just a need to feel protective of the illness and that it might be taken away from you before you're ready to have it taken away. And that is very often true. If we don't give other skills to the client to use instead of the eating disorder, then they're going to need it. Um, and obviously discharge from therapy, premature discontinuation. The Prochaska and Diclementa model is very relevant. I won't go over it. I'm sure um, everyone on the line is very familiar with it or can look it up very easily. But we need to think about clients being in pre-contemplation and contemplation and action and moving between them, even in the same session. We know that the backbone of MET is the OARS approach, asking open-ended questions, affirming listening reflectively and summarising, these are essential skills to work with any eating disorder. I've given you a few sort of sentences here um, that are useful in the eating disorder presentation to think about how we might elicit change talk. I won't go through them all, but they're available here on the slides for you. Here are some other very useful methods for eliciting change talk in eating disorders, casting forwards and backwards in time. Um, we sometimes um, get 
um, clients to write a letter to their eating disorder. And that's a very, can be, actually be a very useful process incorporating some of these sort of where do I want to be and um, what have the effects been in the past. We also know about ears, again, essential for treatment of eating disorders, expressing empathy, showing that you understand, holding your client in unconditional positive regard, amplifying amb ambivalence skillfully, of course, understanding ambivalence, not arguing with it, rolling with that resistance, absolutely pivotal in working with people with eating disorders. You, you, you're, you're not about um, affecting the change this session often. You've got to play the long game and work incrementally in the session to get where you can. Obviously, medical stability being the priority if we have to intervene to get a person to therapy because there is a medical crisis or a mental health suicidal crisis, of course. We put MET down and we go into crisis management. But that being stable, then we are going to be rolling with resistance a lot and very much supporting self-efficacy, sort of a cheerleading on the sideline attitude can certainly help. When you're working with people with eating disorders, whether it's in a comorbid presentation or not, very much thinking about dancing your way with the individual, not wrestling or fighting is, is very useful to always have in mind. And here, just a couple of very practical sort of examples of the dialogue that might be involved in rolling with re resistance, either um, in terms of amplifying the sort of reflection or using the reflecting emotion strategy back to the client. That latter one, very helpful and don't forget about it. Then DBT, how can we use dialectical behaviour therapy um, in the context of treating eating disorder behaviours um, when they are comorb comorbid with drug and alcohol or anything else for that matter? Well, the goal is the same. Um, we're trying to move when we're treating an eating disorder from severe behavioural discontrol through to behavioural control, and this includes all eating disorder behaviours. We have the same hierarchy. We obviously want to um, ensure life first and foremost and ensure that our client is presenting to the session for therapy, secondly. And then the eating disorder behaviours can fall under that DBT model of quality of life interfering behaviours. That's where you would put your eating disorder behaviours and you would just target them in the hierarchy in order of the most life-threatening through to the least. The same core skills as we teach in eating disorders is very, uh, sorry, in DBT is very helpful for eating disorders, core mindfulness, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, emotion regulation and self-management. DBT has been trialled in a number of randomised control trials for bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder, and then radically open DBT um, has been applied to anorexia nervosa with some success. There's not a whole lot of research in that area. It's certainly growing, but I'm, I've treated an awful lot of people with eating disorders using a DBT approach and tailoring it as needed to um, bring symptom reduction across all of the eating disorder symptoms. The DBT assumptions about therapy really work in this client group. Patients are doing the best they can. They do want to improve, even if they don't want to give up the eating disorder, even if they're moving in and out of that in the same moment in therapy. Patients do need to do better. We say that, you know, very gently and carefully and mindfully, try harder and work with you. And your job as a therapist, of course, is to work skillfully to motivate change. Patients have not caused all of their own problems, that is for sure, but they are the only ones that can solve them. And the lives of the complex presentation clients, or suicidal is the DBT language, but I think this applies for a person that's presenting with a number of comorbid um, conditions like eating disorders and drug and alcohol, their lives are unbearable as they currently exist. Um, their appraisal is not invalid, it's valid, and we must help them and work with them to build skills and, and change their life. These therapist characteristics in DBT really work as well in eating disorders, at the, being oriented to change with the client in the room at the same time as being oriented to acceptance and being able to drop back and move forward in the one session, knowing when you need to roll with resistance and accept, but then knowing when the moment to step in and try to target change 
and use change strategies is right. The benevolent demanding with the nurturing and supporting and upskilling, the unwavering centeredness with the compassionate flexibility. These are all very um, uh, essential characteristics really to a highly effective eating disorder therapist. Chain analysis is hugely useful in eating disorders. You would apply it to the eating disorder behaviours in exactly the same way as you would any other um, problem behaviour that you were targeting. Um, I think it's very important to remember that with chain analysis, what we're really trying to do is identify the important factors influencing or controlling the target behaviours and then give the individual the skills to intervene at other points in that chain to alter those controlling variables so that they don't end up engaging in the target behaviour. And so in eating disorders, the type of things that you're going to be looking for in that chain analysis are obviously long periods or even not so long periods of deprivation and starvation, um, um, uh, poor access to food, um, if the person has failed to eat or um, too much access to food, if the person is struggling with binge eating and is eating all of their food, their meals in the kitchen next to the fridge, for instance, we might sort of just change the location of the eating. You're going to be looking for things like lots of judgments around body weight and shape, lots of body checking in mirrors, trigger, triggering events like um, having to expose yourself in some way, whether it be at the beach, with a bikini, at the gym. Um, and then you're going to be using all the standard sorts of skills that you would bring to any behaviour and that behavioural analysis to try to prevent the individual from ending up with that target behaviour. Another therapy that can be really useful to sort of consider um, as part of a dual diagnosis sort of treatment package is one that we call SSCM or Specialist Supportive Clinical Management. Basically this therapy came about because it was designed as the um, as the placebo really intervention in a randomized control trial of what was considered to be the active um, therapy for an eating disorder. And in that trial, SSCM performed as well as the active therapy. I think it was a CBT therapy. So SSCM from there developed as an evidence-based treatment for eating disorders and has been tested a number of times since. And basically it sort of is very sensible clinical management of, um, of an eating disorder. The SE up here refers to severe and enduring because SSCM is a particularly good approach to bring to a person that has had a very long course of anorexia nervosa. It also can be really useful in a long course of the other eating disorders, but that very egocentric attachment to illness that you see with chronic anorexia nervosa, SSCM is, is probably um, the best we have. So what are the aims of SSCM? Very sensible aims to achieve relief of the core symptoms of the eating disorder, to encourage more normal eating, to facilitate some weight gain when needed, or to reduce binging and purging if it's that sort of presentation, to reduce the impact of the patient's anorexia or eating disorder on their quality of life, to foster and maintain a therapeutic relationship between the patient and clinician that facilitates the establishment of normal eating. It's a particularly good match, as I've said, for the chronic or highly egocentric eating disorder presentations. There's a real focus on quality of life improvements in SSCM, particularly in that chronic application. So on relationships, on intimate relationships, friendships, work, leisure, interests, you'll find that eating disorders take over the identity of the individual, particularly in the chronic form, there can be almost nothing else present other than the eating disorder. And so a part of therapy is sort of building all of those other parts of self and life that can gradually edge out the eating disorder, if you like, or certainly give the individual the motivation and the attachment to recovery because there is something to recover for. Here's a typical outline of an SSCM session. 
you review the patient's general progress, you monitor whatever symptoms you've decided to target. So that slide that I presented right at the beginning of the presentation with all the different types of targets for eating disorders that you would have in almost any eating disorder treatment package, whether it be CBT, DBT, SSCM, or integrated into um, a package that's targeting other coping behaviours. So you monitor those target symptoms. You may use the target symptom checklist, which I'll show you next. You review the patient's general progress. How are things going? How's food going? How's weight going? How's relationships going? Very general, supportive clinical management. You acknowledge and praise any attempts at changes. You roll with resistance. You review the patient's eating patterns through dietary recall or, a, or an online diary. You support and encourage regular eating, and you may use weighing and often do as part of SSCM. Here's the symptom target checklist. So um, changes that might have been observed since the last session, the current weight and the change in that since the last session, if it's anorexia nervosa. I mean, if it's bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder, that you're treating, you might need to consider this. Still for bulimia nervosa, this can be really important because the person thinks that when they start to resume normal eating and um, that they will gain weight, that the only reason that they're maintaining their normal weight is because they starve themselves for these long periods before they binge. And that's actually inaccurate. Very few people gain weight in treatment for bulimia nervosa, even when they completely normalise their eating to up to six meals a day with three snacks, three meals, um, they very rarely gain weight. And if they do, they gain a small amount of weight over the first one to two years, which they lose once recovery is maintained. So you still may need to include weight if it's bulimia nervosa to challenge those beliefs. Um, with binge eating disorder, it just depends. And then you'll monitor the eating regular meals, exercise rules, caffeine use, self-harm, self-confidence, anything else you wanted to monitor. Then just as a sort of additional point to consider when you're treating a person with an eating disorder, um, and you've also got the job of treating comorbid conditions, is that at Inside Out, we actually have an e-clinic with digital therapies. They've been under trial up until now, but we're about to make them um, more broadly and freely available to the public. And basically, what does that mean? Um, the e-clinic means that you can refer your client um, to complete an e-therapy for bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder online. It can be a four or 10 sessions. We recommend the 10 session is the um, dose with the most evidence for change, but we actually are seeing quite remarkable change just over four sessions. And they can do that in a pure self-help format online, or they can do it in a guided self-help format. Our e-platform is secure and can create a link between the health professional and the client so that the health professional can monitor their client's progress through the program. They will have weekly sessions with our e-therapist, Claudia, and there's lots of interactives and text-based learning as well. And then they're also, as part of the e-therapy, there is a food diary and a thought diary and a behavioural experiment diary. And this too is linked to their health professional so that they can see how their client is monitoring. And that's um, downloadable on the client's iPhone so that they can just be logging their food, logging their thoughts and their behavioural experiments daily. And as I said, securely linked with the health professional who can guide them through those 10 sessions. Also, as part of that health professionals um, platform, they will have access to an e-learning program that trains them how to guide a person through the 10 sessions. It's literally broken down into session by session. What do I do with my client in session one? What do I do with them in session two? And then of course you send them away after your brief um, session with them to go home and complete um, the one hour session with Claudia online. We also have a lot of um, online training programs available through Inside Out. This is the uh, web link for our e-learning portal. And for anyone who is a staff member or student of the University of Sydney, our online training programs are free. And then in a lot of other places around the country, the health departments might have paid for free use for their clinicians, or you can purchase the programs online. Um, I've, I've um, sort of snapshotted the essentials 
which is our most highly used uh, e-learning program. It covers all of the core competencies associated with uh, learning to identify and diagnose eating disorders and treatment planning, but there are lots of other e-learning programs available there also on our website. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and looking forward to questions and answers. So, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, Sarah couldn't be here today to answer your questions live. Um, please send through any questions that you do have and we will send these to Sarah and post your answers on our website alongside a link to the recording and the slides. I can see that several questions have been coming through while Sarah was speaking. Um, Kath, I don't know whether you have any additional comments or questions that you wanted to raise. Um, yeah, I, I guess there were there's probably a, a few points from the presentation, I think, that might be worth uh, emphasising or re really um, struck me. Uh, and, and I do have a couple of questions that I'll add for Sarah, if that's all right. Um, but what, what really struck me was, you know, that there were a lot of similarities there in relation to alcohol and other drug use and substance use disorders. So um, the, you know, commonalities in which way people may present, for example, so that ambivalence and um, potentially denial not necessarily being uncommon um, to a person presenting for alcohol and other drug treatment services, but, and that that occurs, um, you know, even if they're presenting to that kind of service, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've identified that there is a particular problem in that, that area or one that they want to make changes in. And so I think the discussion that Sarah had around needing to work with the client and meeting them where they're at and the motivational approaches that you use really resonated as something that people working within the alcohol and other drug field would be very familiar with. Um, and for those who are watching who maybe aren't as familiar with it uh, or how those approaches are used in the alcohol and other drug space, I definitely suggest watching the uh, previous webinar uh, available for download on our comorbidity website by Robbie Fullerton. Mm. Um, and we're, you know, similar to what Sarah's done with eating disorders had uh, given some really excellent examples of how to use those motivational enhancement techniques in relation to alcohol and other drugs. Uh, and similarly, I thought there were, that, the really important point around there being other common elements to treatment approaches for eating disorders and alcohol and other drug use that are transdiagnostic. And so many cl clinicians probably being very uh, familiar and having foundational skills, for example, in motivational enhancement or cognitive behavioral therapy, that they can build on that training, um, such as that either provided by Inside Out that uh, Sarah mentioned. Um, and again, for those who maybe are less familiar with the application of CBT in the alcohol and other drug space, uh, an earlier webinar uh, through this series by Joe Casa might also be of interest. Um, can I say something else or am I talking too much? No, no, go ahead. All right, yeah. <laughs> um, I think also something that was really similar in Sarah's presentation to what's seen in the substance use field is around there being an incredible amount of judgment, um, but it being so much more helpful to view behaviours that, that while they have perhaps become maladaptive in the sense that they've become disorders, that they've been really adaptive for the person, a response that they've used to, to cope or keep themselves safe, essentially emotionally safe um, in the situation that they're in. So it makes absolute sense that for both conditions when a person being in, in therapy that those protective mechanisms um, might be activated when you're challenging the eating disorder behaviors um, or the substance use disorder when when you're the therapist might be you know fighting against that in therapy and you know i guess the the other conflict that may be apparent is in relation to control because um you know sarah had mentioned control being a very key feature of eating disorders it's also a feature of substance use but more in the sense of it being characterized by a lack of control mm. and through therapy trying to re-establish that sense of control so i think it'd be interesting to know um or I, i'd like to ask sarah uh, about uh, how that dynamic plays out um with clients who have both uh, both conditions at once 
Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. Some of the things you raised and also what Sarah had been talking about, you know, the need to, or that it being helpful to separate the person from their illness and, you know, view them as different things. And mm. also, you know, a person having potentially a need to feel protective of their illness. Yep. Um, and I can see also that there's been some more comments in the chat, um, which, uh, and Phil and Phil has also commented there, who's also from Inside Out. Um, mm. Thanks, Phil. Hi, Phil. <laughs> um, so there are some more questions that have come through in the Q&A and we will post those to Sarah, as I've said. Um, if there's anything else that you'd like to throw in there just in the last few minutes before we finish up, please feel free. And if you uh, think of something later, please feel free to send that through um, to, well, here's our community guidelines website before we end, um, to any of these addresses here. Um, and we will forward those as well. And we will post the answers to your questions alongside the links to the recording and the slides for this webinar. Um, and you will also, everybody here will also get an email for how to access that um, if you do not, if you're not able to write down this website address very quickly. Um, also to mention that the next webinar that we'll be having is on the 28th of June, and that will be focused on managing symptoms of personality disorders, which is also, as I mentioned before, um, a topic that's come up based on the suggestions of everybody who's been attending this series. So again, if you think of anything that you would like to see as part of this series, please let us know and we'll see what we can do. Um, any last questions, please post them. Any final comments, Kath? And I can see Erin's been madly multitasking in the background, trying to answer your questions and comments. Okay, well, until, until June, thank you so much everybody for coming along um, and please, Enjoy the rest of your day. And of course, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everybody.